Hello, welcome to another episode of the Cancer Now What Vodcast. I'm so excited to welcome two very important physicians in our community treating a type of cancer that is very important to us here in Arizona, skin cancer. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Justin Famoso, board certified radiation oncologist with Arizona Center for Cancer Care, and Dr. Ramin Fafi, board certified dermatologist and Mohs surgeon with Phoenix Surgical Dermatology. Hey, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to he have you here today. Yeah, thanks for having yeah, us. Thank you for having us. Of course, of course. So I just wanna make sure everybody knows who is who, right, when they're looking at this. So Dr. Fafi is our dermatologist and Mohs surgeon, and you are the founder and surgeon at Phoenix Surgical Dermatology Group, correct? That is correct. Great, yes, great, yes. welcome. Thank you. And Dr. Justin Famoso, who is a radiation oncologist with Arizona Center for Cancer Care, and you guys, as I understand it, work together to help people in our community deal with skin cancer. Yeah, you know, cancer treatment is never just one doctor. You need a whole team of doctors, each one specializing in their own uh, subspecialty of that cancer. So yeah, we're part of a team that treats cancer all around the valley, uh, specifically skin cancer, um, as it pertains to today's discussion anyway. Very cool, very cool. Why, um, Dr. Fathi, I'll ask you this one as a dermatologist and most surgeon who really just deals with cancer and skin issues, um, why is it important we talk about skin cancer? Well, that's a great question, Jenny. So the Skin Cancer Foundation came out with an interesting stat that showed that one in five Americans before the age of 70 will get skin cancer. Oh, wow. So it's very common, it's very likely that your friends or family will develop skin cancer or just based off probability alone. Oh so being able to recognize it and know about it is, is really important because it's very treatable. The vast majority of cases can be treated early and not affect your uh, mortality uh, if we, we know about it early. Okay. So how does this start for a patient? They go to their primary care doctor or do they go to a dermatologist once a year for a checkup? And like, how does, how does somebody become aware that they might have something that's suspicious and needs to be looked at? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, first and foremost, uh, as a dermatologist, we try to educate the public on some of the warning signs of what could be a skin cancer. So uh, one acronym that we use is the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma, but that could be applied to skin cancer. A means asymmetry, so anything that looks asymmetric, if you divide it into planes, a little bump, mole, anything, if it doesn't mirror itself, it's asymmetric. Uh, if the borders are irregular, like scalloped versus round or oval shaped, that is another warning sign. That's the B. C is color. Multiple colors to a skin cancer or a, a spot uh, could be a warning sign that it could be a little bit more than just a uh, harmless bump. Okay. Um, D is diameter greater than a pencil eraser or five or six millimeters is our, our threshold. Anything larger than that should be evaluated by a professional just to make sure that, hey, it's it's benign or it could, needs a biopsy. And then the most important one is E, which is evolving. So if you were just to take home one point, anything that's new, changing, itching, crusting, bleeding, you name it, has any symptoms to it, should be evaluated. As far as what's a rule of thumb of how often you should be seen, uh, it's not a bad idea if after the age of 18, you're checked once by a dermatologist or a uh, family physician who, who's very adept at skin, uh, skin screenings, uh, and they would kind of give you your, uh, hey, you should be seen maybe once a year or once every two years type of okay. Uh, diagnosis. Okay, so people then can just remind their primary care doctors to give them a check at their physical if mm -hmm. they don't already suggest it. Could somebody just pick up the phone and call a dermatologist and say, I need, I just want to get an annual skin check? Absolutely. Okay. So a lot of what we do is skin cancer screenings and skin checks just to make sure that what, we're, what the patient is seeing is, is totally either normal or needs to be evaluated further. And then from there, we can either biopsy a spot or have the patient come back at a regular interval, interval just to make sure nothing's changing. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now. 
you hear about different types of skin cancer, right? There's squamous cell, there's melanoma, there's all these different types of skin cancer. Can you explain that a little bit and help us understand the difference? Definitely. So, uh, in general, uh, the type of a cancer that you get is from what cell that it originates from. So, the most common one that we will see is something called a basal cell skin cancer. That's far and away the most common type of cancer that we have in all fields. Uh, and just in the United States alone, we'll see about 3.6 million new diagnoses each year. Oh, wow. Okay. Good news is, that doesn't typically spread to the rest of our body. Okay. It tends to be more of a locally growing type of skin cancer. The next most common is squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is probably, there's about 1.8 million new squamous cells diagnosed each year, just of the skin. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, unlike basal cell, this does have a chance to spread to our lymph nodes and to some of our distant body parts. Uh, so it does actually account for the most skin cancer deaths in the United States. The squamous cell. Yeah, fortunately that number, when you take into account how many squamous cells are diagnosed, is still very low, but there are a subset of bad actors okay. in what we call that squamous cell population. And then the M word, which most people are very familiar with and scared of, is the next most common skin cancer that's called melanoma. Uh, and fortunately, not as many are diagnosed as basal cell or squamous cell, uh, but this one does carry that higher chance of spreading to the rest of our body compared to the latter two. Okay. Um, but the good news is, the vast majority of even melanomas are highly treatable with, you know, we're saying 99% oh, wow. cure rate if caught early. So that's why it's important to to know about those ABCDEs and be able to, to get in with your dermatologist or, or doctor just to get a skin check early if you have something that you're worried about. Okay, good. That, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for setting that stage for us. No problem. So now, okay, so three different types of skin cancers that you mentioned. We're going to treat them all differently, right? I mean, sometimes we need to bring in Dr. Famoso for radiation. Sometimes we need to cut it out. Sometimes we need to bring in a medical oncologist and have chemo. Like, is that even a thing? Dr. Famoso, can you help us understand what role does radiation oncology play in treating any of these three different types of skin cancers? Yeah, that's a great question. And to be honest, radiation tends to lie further down the line in the skin cancer workup and even skin cancer treatment. And sometimes it doesn't play a role at all. Um, but radiation can be a useful tool in certain scenarios. Um, first and foremost, it's important to get a biopsy. So if you see a skin lesion, then it's really important to get in to see Dr. Fothy so that he can take a biopsy of the tissue, which uh, a biopsy is basically just a removal of some of the cells of the skin, look at it under a microscope and, des and describe exactly what kind of cancer this is. Once you know what kind of cancer it is, then you know how to treat it. And the treatment for each cancer varies based on multiple things like size and depth of invasion. And if the cancer has gone to your lymph nodes, there's a whole algorithm that we have to work through in order to figure out, okay, how do we take care of this cancer? But normally, if it's an early stage skin cancer, then something like surgery can be a one and done type treatment. Um, radiation can play a role there if needed, if the cancer is, say, too big for surgery or if it's a spot that can't be operated on or even if a patient can't have surgery, then radiation can play a role. But another way radiation can come into play is if, after surgery, if the cancer was a high-risk cancer. In other words, is the cancer likely to come back? And in that case, you could think of radiation as playing almost like a sterilization role. So the surgeon gets all the cancer, it was a great surgery. Cancer's completely out, but there could be a cancer cell that is living beyond the cut line that we would never know is living there. And in those scenarios, we're talking about, you know, some form of radiation treatment to kill those cancer cells that we don't honestly know if they're there or not, but we know that there's a risk of them coming back, so. Oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense, thanks. So how do people know that their doctors are communicating, right? Like, this is a really important question because so many times, you know, you guys are with different groups, you're in the community together, but how do you make sure to always stay on the same page when it comes to treating one patient and one cancer? Mm -hmm. 
Well, Who wants to take that one? <laughs> I, guess, I guess I see the patient a lot first before I send to Dr. Famoso. Okay. So uh, that's a great question, and it's one that I think is you know important to empower the patient. The patient should be empowered to ask questions. Hey, do I need chemo? Do I need radiation? Do I need imaging for this skin cancer? And your dermatologist or mo and most surgeons should be able to answer that question for you. They should be able to say, hey, here are the facts, here are the statistics, this is your skin cancer. Uh, most often, surgery alone is all we need. You should be okay, but you know that's not a bad idea. This is a little bit of a higher risk skin cancer. Let's call Dr. Famoso and get his opinion on it. Now I'll tell you, there's plenty of times where I'm not sure, and I'll send it to Dr. Famoso, and he, you know, I trust his judgment to the point where uh, he'll, he's not the type of guy that tends to over-radiate things. So it makes me feel comfortable where I can send it to him, it's huge. and he can tell, he'll tell me, well, I think we're good here. Here's why we should do radiation, or here's why we shouldn't do radiation. So having that type of collaboration and having that trust in each other, that makes me comfortable to know that when I send my patients there, we're getting really good care. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And I always tell my patients, you know, it's we're literally connected at the hip. <laughs> with with modern communication, we can use encrypted text messages, we get yeah. a phone call, and we're literally just two seconds away. This isn't the old days where we have to send a fax and then wait five hours and then a fax might come back and it might not. And you don't know if the doctor even got it and maybe a nurse threw it away. You know, whatever. Yeah. Now I just text them. Exactly. We have encrypted, patient protected, HIPAA compliant text messaging systems where I just say, hey man, I have a patient who has a strange skin lesion and I'm not a dermatologist, I can't make that diagnosis. Would you like to just take a look at it and tell me that everything looks okay or if not, can you take care of it? And, and within five seconds, Dr. Fathi reads it, sends a text back and you know, literally phone in our hip, we're connected at the hip. I love that. Yeah. That's huge because I was just going to ask too, it's like, I mean, you think about all the, when you go to the doctor, how many people work there and how many different um, lines of communication are going back and forth to different specialties at different offices. So I love, um, I love when I get to hear and that when our audience gets to hear um, that physicians are texting each other oh, yeah. about my care. That's important to me, right? So keep doing that. That's good. <laughs> um, so. Okay, so there are dermatologists, Dr. Fathi, that can, that are dermatologists, and then there are dermatologists that are also Mohs surgeons. Absolutely. Can you explain, because I know you're both, mm -hmm. right? Can you explain, is that like a div, an added specialty? Um, what does that mean that the patient can get from you? Is it okay if they go to a dermatologist that's not a Mohs surgeon? Help me understand that. Yeah, so all Mo, all dermatologists are who are board certified are adept at detecting and diagnosing skin cancer uh, and doing that procedure that Dr. Famoso mentioned, which is a skin biopsy. Uh, so all board certified dermatologists sh should be able to do that with a very, very high level of competency. Uh, after f uh, residency, uh, dermatologists can choose to do an additional one year of training in a fellowship uh, in Mohs surgery. And we have an overarching uh, uh, group or organization called the American College of Mohs Surgery, uh, which has our, it's pretty much our oversight committee that says, hey, you need to do for this year this many number of cases under the direct supervision of a leader in the field. Okay. So the, the, the number is 650 surgeries under the direct supervision of someone who's considered a leader in the field. And then from there, you're considered to be a fellowship trained Mohs surgeon. Uh, this October, we're actually now gonna have our first board exam for Mohs surgery. Oh, so wow. you can actually look out for board certified Mohs surgeons. Uh, and during that time, you uh, our, our uh, training encompasses dealing with all types of skin cancers, especially high-risk skin cancers that require multidisciplinary care and knowing how to navigate that multidisciplinary field. That's kind of where some of the complicated uh, cases come into play is okay. that multidisciplinary aspect. And then doing the advanced facial reconstruction to hide the scars or the, whole, the, the big, large holes that are left mm -hmm. from some of these big cancers so they're not disfiguring. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that too because a lot of times I've heard that um, patients who need to have Mohs surgery or have cancer surgically removed, sometimes the plastic surgeon has to come in to help fix some of that mm -hmm. scarring. 
there's some things that on the face I know that Dr. Famoso can treat that won't leave as much of a scar mm -hmm. as the surgery might. Sometimes that might be appropriate. Um, do you guys want to speak to that a little bit? When do you bring in a plastic surgeon or decide not to cut because of a, a cosmetic reason? Yeah, so uh, great question. So I think a lot of that comes down to the comfort of the, the fellowship trained Mohs surgeon who's doing your procedure. Okay. Uh, so if it's someone who's done a lot of skin cancer reconstruction in their training, uh, they may be able to handle most of the stuff. My general rule of thumb for my practice is if it's something that needs general anesthesia and I don't feel like I can keep the patient comfortable, mm. then I endorse the help of someone who can take them to the operating Hospital. room, whether that's a ear, nose, and throat doctor or a uh, uh, plastic surgeon. Uh, additionally, there's another type of test that we sometimes run called a sentinel node biopsy, where I can't do that under local anesthesia. Uh, and that procedure has to be coordinated with the repair as well. So in those situations, those special circumstances, I will endorse the help of a head and neck surgeon or someone who can do that biopsy and also go ahead and do the reconstruction at the same time. Great, anything to add? Um, well, I mean, from a radiation perspective, my job is to always maintain the aesthetics of the surgeon's work. So after a surgery, a lot of times radiation is necessary to do cleanup duty for these cancer cells that may get left behind like we were talking about. And as a radiation oncologist, I see my role as maintaining the the cosmetic outcome of the surgical scar that may or may not be there, the skin graft, which may or may not be there. Um, basically living by that creed of do no harm. So, okay. so <laughs> you know, I don't employ a plastic surgeon, but I certainly mind their work and, and make sure to preserve it. Great, mm -hmm. great, thank you. So uh, I wanna wrap up by asking you both um, about new developments in skin cancer treatment. And I'll start with you, Dr. Fathi. What's, what's going on, what's new? I mean, you know, we, we've heard a lot of really cool things that you guys are able to do, but, but what's on the horizon? What are we excited about? Well, well I'm, I'm still excited about Mohs surgery, which is our ability to keep a skin cancer uh, defect as small as possible and get the highest possible cure rates. For many of these skin cancers, the cure rate's over 99%, That's and huge. you get the smallest hole. Can't say that about a lot of cancers, so. Can't, and it's been around for almost 90 years now, so the track record is uh, has proven itself. Uh, as far as cancers that have spread to the rest of our body, what's new and exciting is a field called immunotherapy. And this is really exciting because it's using our own immune system to come and fight off the skin cancer that may have spread to the rest of our body. Very cool. So what does that mean? Better results, we're curing cancers that you know, 20, 30 years ago was pretty much a, a death sentence with less side effects. Wow. Wow. Those chemo side effects that everyone kind of attributes to uh, mm -hmm. chemotherapy, we're not seeing that as much anymore. Right. And so we hear about immunotherapy a lot in the cancer world. Is it something that's specifically helpful for melanomas and skin cancers? I feel like every time I open a medical journal, there's a new indication for immunotherapy. <laughs> you know, it started with melanoma. It did, It okay. started with melanoma. And you know, at first, there was a lot of optimism, but it was guarded because melanomas, which were previously thought to be almost a death sentence in some regards, were now something that became a chronic condition where you get your immunotherapy and the cancer remains at bay. And I've seen patients who've had immunotherapy for 10 years now and they're still cancer free. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on the early clinical trials even. Um, but every time you open a journal, you find a new indication for immunotherapy, and, and it's really revolutionizing cancer care. Patients are living longer with fewer side effects, um, and that's the goal. That's the goal. Um, and interestingly, we're using a lot of immunotherapies on clinical trials, which are open at the Virginia Piper Cancer Center. Uh, we collaborate closely with some of the doctors there, and we're seeing a lot of rare cancers in high volume at the Virginia Piper Cancer Center things that previously nobody knew how to treat because there was no data. We're in the process of accruing that data. We're accruing patients and we're treating rare cancers that were never treated this way before with innovative strategies, including radiation and surgery and immunotherapy. And it's a really exciting time to, to be a cancer doctor Very because cool. every day there's something new. Very cool. Yeah. And so if patients are interested in enrolling in some of these studies or want to come see you guys, is the best way to go to your website, um, which I can list all that information for everyone. Um, but is, you know, they can get into studies and things like that just by giving you guys a call, right? 
you like you'll let them know if they're eligible, Definitely. that kind of a thing. If Absolutely. they're indicated Great. for it, yes. Great, perfect. Well, thank you both so much for being here today. This was a really important conversation, especially living here in Arizona. And I'm so grateful that you took the time. I know you have busy schedules and and I really appreciate you being here with us today. Yeah, well, thank a, you for having us. Yeah, yeah, it's a privilege to be here. Yeah, thank definitely. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for a very special episode of Cancer Now What? We're so happy to have had these conversations that are so important with Dr. Justin Famoso of Arizona Center for Cancer Care and Dr. Ramin Fathi from Phoenix Surgical Dermatology Group. If you'd like information on either of these physicians or to contact them, you can go to their website AZCCC or Arizona Center for Cancer Care is www.arizonaccc.com and Phoenix Surgical Dermatology Group is psdermgroup.com. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time. <laughs>